physically, mentally, uh, physically. And then uh, both of them are pretty much back to full sport. So how was it getting back in the sport? Um, how, you know, mentally was it tough to be like, oh, I'm going to start hitting jumps again on the skis or the snowboard or getting back on my bike? Um, we're just going to kind of go through that. So we kind of want to be interactive. So if you guys can, you know, just chat me um, questions, we'll just fill them in as we go. And then I think Jill will also be helping with questions as well. So maybe first let's have Robin just kind of let us know what happened, like kind of a little bit of your history, how you hurt yourself, um, and then going in to kind of see Dr. Cunningham and kind of figuring out that you needed surgery. And then we'll go to Pat for the same thing. We'll have Dr. Cunningham kind of talk about each case a little bit. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Robin Kissel. Um, I am a snowboarder. Um, I have, uh, I blew my ACL last in February of 2019. Um, it was the second time I'd injured my knee and I did it this time by uh, knuckling a larger jump. Um, I was pretty convinced that it wasn't an ACL this time because the second ACL tear felt incredibly different than the first ACL tear. Um, so I didn't actually see Dr. Cunningham until a month, just about a month after the initial injury. Um, and I went to Dr. Cunningham based on referrals from um, friends who had recently had the same surgery that I was going to have. Um, and then I had also worked with Dr. Jaynes many years before in my first ACL um, repair. And he also referred Dr. Cunningham. Um, so I went to go see Dr. Cunningham about a month after the injury, uh, found out it was an ACL again with quite a bit more damage than I did the first time. Um, and it was gonna be a two-step process. Um, I wasn't convinced that I needed an ACL surgery and I could survive and continue my lifestyle without an ACL. Um, so I spoke with Dr. Cunningham pretty thoroughly about what my options were. And I took about a week to think about getting my ACL repaired with, with the recovery um, and going back through the healing process again. And then I did decide to go through it. Um, I had two, a two process, two step surgery. I had bone grafting done. Um, in April of 2019, and then I had my ACL revision via quad graft done in August of 2019. Um, and then I ended up choosing Avalanche Physical Therapy in particular, um, working with Josh via a referral as well from one of my friends who I had met through the rec center, and she and her entire family had gone to Josh, and she said, if you want to get back to your normal lifestyle, this is your guy. Um, so that's kind of my quick story. Thanks, Robin. Um, appreciate that, too. Uh, Pat, you want to give a little bit of history on yours as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, this was definitely a really tough one for me. I blew both of them at the same time. Never, uh, never did that. Always kind of had one and was like, oh, yeah, it's an ACL or a meniscus or this or that. So it's kind of an easy cookie to swallow. But having two and then having to figure out the timing with getting them both done at the same time or getting one done and then later on and finding that time to be able to get the rehab done and just be away from work and, and away from the sports that we love. Um, so it was, it was definitely rough, um, but just kind of got to take it for what it is and know that you got to pay to play and dig deep and just kind of find that tough guy bone, I guess, or tough girl bone that you, you need to find during hard times like that. And, uh, it was, uh, it was last, it was 2018 December when I did it. And then I had my surgery 2019 in the spring um, and then I did my ACL surgery first. Luckily, it was just the ACL and slight meniscus cleanup. And then it was uh, three months later that I had my right meniscus done. And then Uller graced us with 20 inches of snow. So that was comical to add in there. But uh, yeah, once I was able to kind of get the schedule figured out and just kind of do all the planning and everything that comes along with it. Um, it's not as bad as it, it's not 
it's not the worst thing in the world, you know. Every, you can everyone anyone can bounce back off of it. It's just kind of up to yourself on your rehab regimen and and how bad you really want to to get back to it. Um, but yeah, two knees, one year. Uh, it was definitely learning experience for sure. Right, and we'll, we'll get to more of the rehab too as well. Um, Dr. Cunningham, do you mind kind of getting into, you know, just what you saw in both of them and uh, kind of like what you go through when you see, a, you know, what you think is an ACL or do you get an MRI for it or and then all that good stuff and how you kind of look at it? Yeah, I, I think, you know, people give that classic history, especially with skiing, you know, or snowboarding that there's a certain, you know, obviously we hear the dreaded pop story. People report, hey, I heard a pop, you know, I landed in the back seat heard a pop, uh, that sort of thing, or flat landing on a snowboard. That's kind of your classic, I would say. Um, Again, Robin was a little different because she had had a prior ACL, so it's going to feel different when you tear an ACL graft versus your original ACL. Um, Your original ACL is just so much more vascular that you're going to fill your knee with blood, and uh, it's a different feeling than if you tear a graft, typically. Um, but you no know, patients uh, come into the office and typically will give that sort of history though, if it's a first time ACL, felt a pop, had immediate pain, I felt unstable. <clears throat> People oftentimes will say, I tried to put my ski back on or my snowboard back on and tried to take a turn and my knee gave out again. And then I knew that uh, I knew I, I couldn't get myself down the hill and I had to take the sled or I you know, slowly got myself down the hill. Um, and uh, you know, then they'll find my way, find their way. Oftentimes, in the in the see me in the office, and uh, we just get that history first of all. And uh, from the history, you can glean a lot of uh, important details. And then a physical exam is key. Just examining the knee and always comparing it to the other knee. And uh, especially if the other knee is normal, we can feel laxity in that affected knee, and do certain tests to determine if it's just the ACL or if it's the MCL because the MCL ACL is a common pattern, especially with snow sports. Um, and then typically we get an x-ray just to make sure we're not missing a fracture. And plus the insurance companies typically won't approve an MRI without an x-ray, so we get the x-ray. And then oftentimes an MRI scan because an MRI we can see all the soft tissues in the knee. We see the bone too, but we see all the soft tissues like the ligaments, the meniscus, the cartilage. And then um, and then sit down and you know, often have to break that bad news to folks uh, that they had an ACL tear um, and then get into what the surgery is, what the recovery is. You know, with both Robin and Pat, they're both super active. They're on the hill a lot. Um, and uh, in that active of a, of a patient, we, we definitely want to, um, you know, one can live without an ACL, especially if someone said, that's it, I'm never going to ski or snowboard again. I'm just going to ride my bike and do some walking and hit the gym. I mean, you can, you can do okay without an ACL, but most of the patients that live in our locations don't want to give up those activities, especially cutting and pivoting sports. So then it's ACL reconstruction surgery. And uh, the first dis- discussion we have is whether we would use ten- a, a tendon graft from the patient or from a donor. I'm not a big fan of donor tendon ACLs just because they do tear or stretch at a much higher rate than if we use people's own tendon. And and so therefore people's own tendon, it really comes down to three choices, whether we use the central third of one's patellar tendon, uh, two of the hamstring tendons, or a piece of the quadricep tendon. And um, I've been doing this for nearly 18 years. And the first 10 years, I did a lot of hamstring grafts and they work well, but they're oftentimes a little smaller than we like. And... uh, um, in the last like, seven years, I've used mainly just quad tendon because it's such a big, beefy graft. And uh, the morbidity, meaning the, the side effects, let's say, of taking that tendon are very, very low compared to other tendon grafts. So that's really been my go-to graft. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, I work with some of the ski team U.S. athletes. And, and if one of them tore their ACL, I would definitely use a quad uh, tendon graft. Um, and Josh, we can... I can get into details on surgeries, but I guess the just a couple points in relationship to Robin and Pat. You know, Robin, because she had had a prior ACL, um, what can happen sometimes is the, the tunnels that we create in the bone to accept the graft can expand over time. And we don't want to put a new graft into a loose socket because it just won't grow in well and then it could re-tear. Um, and then oftentimes the tunnels can even move a little bit and they're not in a perfect location in the knee. 
And, um, and then techniques have changed. And so I think we're be much better now at placing an ACL perfectly in the knee where it once lived versus we were 15 years ago. So in Robin's case, I just said, we don't want to take shortcuts. We got a bone graft you, unfortunately, come back in four months and then do your new ACL. And that's what we did. Um, on Pat's left knee, we um, basically, it was just a first time ACL with some meniscus work. So it was, didn't have to do that uh, two stage type procedure. So, and I can, I'll probably cut myself off there. I'm happy to answer technical questions if people have them or we can just get right into the rehab aspects. Perfect, thanks Dr. Cunningham. Yeah, that was the interesting thing with Robin. So I actually saw Robin um, after the bone graft and you know, you go through the process of getting her back, getting her strong. She was riding her bike again, and then she has to go for another surgery. So, you know, Robin, how was that with that kind of emotional roller coaster where, you know, I'm getting better, I'm getting better, but in the back of your mind, you're like, I'm just getting better so I can have another surgery. And then you kind of go back to square one. Um, you know, what was that like? And, you know, how did you kind of push through those type of things? Because, I mean, you're active. You're always on the mountain. You work at Vail. So, you know, you probably get hundreds of days on the mountain and, now you weren't allowed to this past winter. Sure. I think that um, it was a little easier going into it because I knew it was going to be a two-stage process. I knew that uh, when I tore my ACL this time and it hurt, I knew that my season was probably over in February. So I'd already kind of retired the um, previous winter knowing that I wasn't going to be back on snow. Um, after the bone grafting, I was still able to do a lot of things. I was still able to do more mellow biking. Um, I had to take my clipless pedals off, but aside from that, I could still use flat pedals. So I was still able to get a lot of biking in throughout the summer, which helped with kind of that mental aspect. Um, and for me, it was really, really motivating to know that I needed to stay strong and maybe even get slightly stronger before the ACL surgery. Um, so for me, that was a big motivation to continue with uh, sort of rehab slash prehab for the ACL. Um, what was most chall more challenging for me was um, I had been training to do a trail half marathon, um, the Pikes Peak Ascent. So it's a pretty challenging uphill trail marathon and that was taken away and I had been training for two years for that marathon. So that was kind of more of that mental struggle than knowing I was going to have to go back into surgery. Um, so the way that I dealt with that is I replaced running with more lifting and then more biking as well. So I had some other outlets. Um, but there were still definitely days that would have like perfect running weather days. There are definitely tears for sure. Um, I have a great support system as far as my friends and family, which really helped. And then um, Dr. Cunningham and Josh, you guys were also awesome with sort of that emotional support piece. Josh, I know you saw a few tears for me throughout the roller coaster as well. Um, but just knowing that I was in good hands of, of very talented professionals helped to kind of push through that piece as well. And, and Pat, when, when you started like coming back, I mean, you've been a pro skier for a while and you're trying to kind of get back and, um, you know, in the pro skiing world, you're a little older for that. So it's even harder to be like, okay, I need to get back into that game. When you first started from your recovery of ACL, what was going through your head? Were you like, all right, you know, I'm still going to ski obviously after this, but I might not hit it as hard as I used to. Or were you like, no, I'm extra motivated. I'm coming back. I'm going to be better than I ever have been before. Still muted, Pat. There you go. So uh, I was definitely as hungry as I could have been, 120% fully. Knew exactly what I wanted to do when I came back and how I needed to do it. Um, so being 33 now was definitely like, all right, I mean, I'm probably not going to lock down the Monster Energy or the Red Bull contract, but that's not why I started doing this. And basically the stoke and the feeling and everything that comes along with a great day of sports or skiing or what have you is basically all I really needed was to just, uh, first of all, kind of, I went home to my mom's house for three months and, I got kind of sick of her and she got kind of sick of me for a little bit. So I used that, uh, used that motivation to kind of wrap up the whole 
rehab thing and just really buckled down and I quit drinking alcohol two years ago um this spring or this fall pre this ski season 2019 fall I uh got out of doing the rehab and then you cleared me for CrossFit so it was like boom bomb the next thing I'm doing is getting right into CrossFit um I got a road bike maybe in the, like the middle of the summer, um, got basically moved from back home, living with my mom for a couple months to get the rehab going, rented a condo with a few friends that had already lived there right across the street from the rec center, basically fully because I wanted to take it as serious as I could be the first one at the gym. be at PT as much as I could be on the bike path and, uh, just kind of see how my body felt while I had the the nutrition, the working out, the sobriety and everything like that into effect. And holy, it was, it was the best season I've ever had. I can't even believe that I had two knee surgeries last spring and just seeing where I was at in like January and then being able to see the shots that I got a few weeks back at an undisclosed location <laughs> um, that uh, it just, I couldn't believe it. The, it was just like, Holy, it was like winning the lottery almost it was just like, Oh my God. Wow. Like I really put my head down and I didn't, there was a couple like points in the rehab where I was like, um, my like quad sore, this is sore. Is it, or maybe the, third day skiing when I accidentally hit the jump filming my buddy and you yelled at me Josh but uh yeah it was definitely it was it's an up and down type of thing but you just gotta you gotta find the positive friends that are around you and and let them reinstate that positivity in you and that inspiration and really just go from there and and know what you want to do and put 120 percent into it Perfect. Yeah, I mean, kind of jumping ahead a little bit was kind of interesting because we didn't clear you to start uh, skiing again until January. And then, you know, you have a Vimeo video that's coming out, um, you know, next year and all the shots that you're able to get, even even though you weren't cleared until January, uh, especially with the mountain shutting down, you know, you couldn't go to the resort. So you just had to find a bunch of backcountry things to, to get into. Um, but with Robin, when you came to me pretty much right after surgery, and usually you know, if you're staying in the staying in Colorado, Dr. Cunningham, or even if you're not, he wants you to kind of, you know, get into PT, you know, in the first couple of days after surgery, usually about three days. Um, and our goals are, you know, let's get that range of motion back. Um, if there's no meniscus problems, let's start trying to get the gait a little better with your brace on. Um, and then um, on top of that, you know, we gotta get that quad firing again. So after after your injury, your quad just shuts down. It's too much trauma, it just shuts down. And if that quad doesn't start firing, you know, it can give out during gait. Um, you just don't have a lot of control getting into um, your leg in the bed. And Robin, did you, like when you first started therapy after the two surgeries, you know, what was your hardest part? Was it getting your motion back? Was it getting your quad to fire? You know, what was kind of the things you had to struggle with initially? Um. I think the two biggest things that kind of strike me were um, my first ACL was a cadaver graft. And so it wasn't harvested at the, and my very first surgery years and years ago, it was just the knee that had to heal. And this time um, with the quadricep graft, um, it was a different level of pain that I was like mentally prepared for. But then when it actually came down to it, um, that level of pain that came with having to heal not only the knee, but the graft side as well was um, a bit of a challenge at the beginning. Um, and then the other piece that was, uh, I think one of the hardest parts about um, the initial PT process was getting my flexion back. Extension came back pretty quickly, um, but I felt like for like three weeks I was stuck at a pretty painful spot in the, um, the flexion of my knee and, and Josh would have to really get in there and kind of, it felt like kind of hammer on that knee to start to get that quad to release, to get that flexion back. Um, but in the relative of being in, in uh, PT, I just got cleared from PT like a month ago. So I had been in PT from April of 2018 until 
May of 2020. Um, so in the realm of the length of time I was in PT, that three weeks of not having that flexion is, was pretty minimal in that healing process. And then going back to you, Pat, so, you know, you had PT in New York and then you came to us <clears throat> like three months out. So around three months, you can really start kind of pushing strength, start getting back to, you know, some lighter activities. Um, when you were in New York, were you, you know, were you still doing the PT thing? Were you just kind of doing things on your own, hang out with your mom or kind of how, how did you kind of push it? Yeah, I did. Uh, I enlisted in PT out there. Um, and uh, start. I actually went to the Frisco um, Bale Summit or uh, Avalanche Physical Therapy. I think I only got seen there two or three times before getting back to New York. And then once I got back to New York, I uh, got situated with uh, a couple of physical therapists out there at a clinic and uh, went through with that. And then once I came out back out to Colorado, I was like, Ah, I'm back. This is awesome. <laughs> no more New York State. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it. Um, uh, it's the most important thing. I I hear. I heard actually a guy in the physical therapy in New York say, "Oh yeah, three months. You know, like a regular person will usually be done with physical therapy after that." And I looked at him. I was like, "Wait, what? Like." people injure themselves get a surgery done and then they don't take the physical therapy serious like how can you treat your castle like that or you know your but um yeah it just kind of goes to show what uh what happens in other areas that aren't as active and uh just stoked to be out here surrounded by awesome pt people and um awesome peers like robin and yeah just stoked to be living in Colorado that's for sure and it does kind of make our job a little easier as PTs and um, probably Dr. Cunningham say even as um, surgeons as well is because everyone here is so motivated um, and then in my past I've worked in all over the country I've worked in probably five different states and you know to have such active patient population you really make our job easier and, and we're more of we have to slow you down and um, both Pat and Robin would always come in saying, hey, can I do this now? Can I do this? And like, no, don't do it yet. You know, let's let things heal. Um, and you're just kind of slowly pushing them. Uh, kind of like Pat was talking about when he accidentally hit a jump. And it's like, no, Pat, don't, don't get into that quite yet. And the reason is we, you know, you want everything to sit and you want it to stick. You don't, you don't want to get a little bit of fun and then the worst thing happens and you have to go back and then you got to see Dr. Cunningham again. And, um, you know, he's got to do another surgery for you guys and you just go back to square one. And obviously every time that you go back into the knee, it's going to be a little harder than the first time. Um, and that's one reason Robin was with us so long. She had two surgeries, but it was also the third surgery on that knee in the second ACL. So um, it takes a little longer. And then with Pat, what he was talking about, so he came to see me and then all of a sudden we're moving pretty strong. He's getting better, better, better. We're starting to get into um some more dynamic things and then he has to do his meniscus on his other leg so pat how was that when we were together and you're getting real strong and then all of a sudden we had to really you know quiet things down a little bit um because because of the other knee um it was definitely pretty wild going from a quad tendon graft to just a scope because i didn't it had been probably five years since my last scope and uh the the most painful part was IV going in my arm. I couldn't believe it. It was it was a amazing, clean, quick procedure. Um, leading up to it, the day before, I was like, "Oh my God, really? I got to go through all of this again." And I just kind of tried to not think about it. Just know I had to get it done and do it. Figured out a ride over there, and yeah, it definitely uh, it was a tough one to swallow because I was in the back of my head before I had um, set up all the doctor's office meetings and the x-rays and all that stuff and the CAT scans I was like oh this will be I mean it is what it is I'll just get both done at the same time and save time you know and and thank god I didn't do that that would have been rough but yeah there's definitely there's definitely positive to the negative you know and yeah you're gonna fall down and get bruised but I'm just gonna get back up and get stronger
Um, Dr. Cunningham, do you have any, um, like for people that are wondering that are out there, do you have kind of like guidelines of, okay, at three months we can start X, or I think they might come back to sport at this time. Uh, I mean, everyone's different. All surgeries are different. I always tell patients, like, don't just, you know, compare yourself to your buddy who had ACL surgery because, you know, you might have had two surgeries. They had a meniscus involved, MCL, whatever. Um, but general guidelines of kind of how, how things progress. Yeah. I, so <clears throat> let's say just straight quad ACL, no meniscus work, no significant arthritis, not a redo like a Robin case. Uh, you know, patients typically, you know, go home the same day. Uh, I tell people you're going to be in a hinge knee brace with your knee held straight for usually the first two weeks or so, maybe three until your quad wakes up and Josh says, Hey, yeah, her quad is woken up and we can do, you know, they can do a straight leg raise and we can discontinue the brace and restore your normal walking gait. Um, we get you in PT as Josh said right away within the, for even the next day is fine or within a couple days, definitely. Um, get you spinning on a stationary bike as soon as we can within a few days if possible, but some people don't get adequate motion to get around on the pedals even till two weeks or so just um, whether we take a quad graft or a patellar tendon graft anything from the extensor mechanism can slow that ability as Robin said to get your flexion to get around on the bike but we get it eventually um, but when we can get around on a bike we're initially spinning the first six weeks is really just getting the swelling down um, so that we can maximize the range of motion getting the pain under control in that first week or two um, we're using a nerve block. The anesthesiologists out here are great. They place a nerve block that now lasts for even a couple of days. So in the first few days, patients are not having a lot of pain because the nerve block is doing a lot of the work at relieving pain. You know, at six weeks or so, I tell people, okay, your quad has healed enough that we can start to put some resistance across the quad. So Josh is now going to start some gentle strengthening stuff. We're going to add some resistance to the bike. Um, you can get in a pool and start to kick in a pool a little bit, walk against the resistance of the water, aqua jog, things like that. Um, and then, you know, I'd let uh, someone then get on a bike outdoors, uh, probably around week 10 to 12 or something like that after a straightforward quad ACL and they can start to ride on the flats. As, as Robin alluded to, maybe not the clips right away, but after, you know, by three and a half, four months, you could use that. Um, swing in a golf club, uh, short game stuff at three months, driver at four and a half months, um, light hiking. Uh, I should say jogging at around four months. Um, we'll start to do some jogging, um, some light hiking subsequent to that, uh, usually with poles, especially coming downhill. I tell people you can power uphill, just take it easy coming down, just don't want you to slip on some loose gravel, twist your knee. Um, and then, you know, at six months, if it was a winter, I'd let someone uh, snowshoe, maybe some Nordic skiing. Uh, but to get back to, you know, snowboarding, skiing, after a straightforward ACL, we used to try six months. And honestly, there was a pretty high retear rate. I shouldn't say retear rate. People, you know, would, it, either, you know there was a concerning amount of people that would tear their graft or stretch their graft and so it's really eight months to get cleared to ski or snowboard um, and that depends on a sports test with Josh. Uh, we just want to see on a sports test he'd compare your strength on the affected side to the other side and we want it within 90% of normal to let you do those sorts of things and if you pass it at eight months we let you do that. Um, I get people in a sports brace for the first year back to those activities and I say, you don't have to wear it the rest of your life. Just give me one year in that brace when you're cutting and pivoting. Um, but some people don't get there at eight months. Some people it's nine. So uh, even sometimes longer. We just, everyone's a little different. And that's what I outlined is kind of the average patient. Some people are a little faster, some a little slower, but. Thanks, Dr. Cunningham. Um, so we had a question over from Casey. Um, he's kind of asking me, like, how do I personally help um, you know, patients with their emotional and mental problems, um, you know, that come up because, you know, we always think of it as just a physical, like, all right, my knee doesn't work. I get my knee to work and I'm, I'm back at it. Um, I, so far, you know, not going wood, have been lucky enough not to have an ACL um, repair or anything like that or reconstruction, um, but I have treated a lot. And so basically for me personally, I try to approach each person individually and try to get to know them personally. You know, sadly for them, they're with me for a while. Um, just if insurance allows it. So uh, we might as well get to know each other. And, you know, I know a lot about Pat and Robin personally. We still talk to each other, even though they're done with therapy. Um, and I've helped Pat build a few jumps this winter in the backcountry. Um, but, you know, you kind of make that connection and kind of see what, see what gets them excited. Um, 
and let them know like it's going to be okay. I tell a lot of people look for the small goals. Like, oh, look, I did a straight leg raise with my legs straight. I got into bed by myself. Um, I was able to, um, you know, walk without a limp this time. And those little goals help get you through it because it's a long process. If you keep thinking, oh, I'm not on the mountain yet, that's going to be a long recovery. So you kind of have to, you know, look for those small goals. And, you know, one of the biggest goals here is getting your, um, getting around the bicycle, the stationary bike for the first time. You know, it's everyone, you know, as a knee, knee um, injury, they kind of remember that day where they, they got around the bike. Um, Dr. Cunningham was talking about too, you know, trying different things. So I work here at the rec center, so I have access to the pool. Robin got in the pool with me a lot. Um, we have access to the weight room. Even now, right now during um, COVID, the rec center is open. It's um, appointment only, but I still do my aquatic class on Thursday with a limited amount of people. And then also we can still go into the weight room. The weight room's not very crowded right now, so it's kind of nice to be able to kind of get to the machine, to the turf field. Um, and so it just adds a little different component and, and keeps it from being boring. You know, people are going to see PT two or three times a week for a while. Um, they want, they need a little variety. You want to keep it kind of fun for them. PT can only be but so fun, I imagine. Um, but, you know, Pat or Robin, whichever one wants to answer first, you know, how did that work with you guys? You know, the emotional, the, the mental part of it, you know, usually, you know, your day off, you're probably out on the mountain with your friends. Now your friends are all gone. So you're, you're potentially by yourself hanging out. You know, how did you guys deal with that? Um, and then what did you expect from like, like Dr. Cunningham and myself, like for helping you through some of those times where you like, oh, they're just the professionals, they'll take care of my physical part and I'll rely on my family for the rest of it. Or, or what do you guys think? Um, like you were saying, Josh, I definitely relied on like my entire network system to kind of get through those challenging emotional and mental pieces. Um, I really learned to redefine success. Um, picked back up like Nordic skiing. So I was still outside, picked back up snowshoeing. So I was still outside like in the snow when my friends were on the mountain. So there were some other like replacement pieces. Um, as far as support from Josh and Dr. Cunningham, um, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time with Josh. I went to PT at least two times a week, again, from April of 2019 until last month. Um, so I felt really comfortable kind of sharing a lot of those really challenging moments. Um, and Josh was really good about creating a really comfortable place to be able to do that and have some positive words around that as well. Um, and then with my checkups with Dr. Cunningham and his team, um, they're an incredibly, um, sympathetic team. They always, you know, going into Dr. Cunningham's office, I always felt like, the team had an investment in my healing as well. I wasn't just like the next ACL that Dr. Cunningham has seen 9 million of these. I felt like there was an, a vested interest in, in getting better. So that definitely helped with that sort of emotional and mental comfort for my side. Pat, do you have anything to add with like the emotional mental part for your recovery? Yeah, definitely. Um, you just want to make sure you don't, get caught up with spreading yourself too thin you know like your focus your main focus in life is your rehab and getting back to 120 percent and for me it was buy a nice pair of muck boots with the anti-slip sole and go to work every single day all day long come home and just stay focused on that end goal of I'm taking January February March April off and I'm going skiing and there wasn't a question in my mind, like, like at in January it was it was CrossFit at six a.m. It was I actually started getting into hot yoga to make sure I was could take the hits and the tweaks and this and that, and um, thankfully got linked up with uh, Asterisk Knee Braces. They signed me to a one year deal and couldn't be more thankful for that company. Um, responding back to my proposal and just yeah making sure that you know you're around positive inspirational people that that kind of have the same goals as you and want to push you and motivate you and and see you exceed your true true talent you know and um want to thank you Josh big time for just being that positive motivation in me I remember multiple days in 
physical therapy, I was just like sitting there, like I'm 32 years old. Like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I should get a real job for 12 months a year. And then I was just like, Oh no, like, there's no way I can do that. I got to keep doing this. I didn't, there's no like here, there, this, that, you know, what makes me happy is skiing and, and working. So you kept me motivated and, and, uh, focused on the end goal and just, yeah, wanted to thank you for that one big time. No problem, Pat. I mean, that's, that's what we got into the business for. I mean, we're, we're here to help you guys out. And, um, you know, it, for me, at least, it's very exciting to see you guys act the fact. So I love when people just stop in like, hey, man, I just did this jump or I just did this or I'm doing things that I haven't done in a long time or I'm just back to my normal life and I'm not even thinking about my legs anymore. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what we look for, too, is we all came out here for the same reason. We're all active. And, you know, I think luckily I haven't had too many like major injuries that keep me out of doing things. But I think about myself where you know, if I had an injury, you know, what would I do? Like, I'm always active. I'm doing something, you know, whether it be snowboarding, paddleboarding, hiking, whatever, like I'm out doing something. So, you know, I want to get back to my life. And so that's where I kind of try to put myself in your shoes and try to, you know, help get you guys back to it. Um, let's go to Robin. So Robin, we've, we've gotten through your quad. We've gotten, you're walking normal, um, but you're still weak. And for you, we used a lot of, uh, dry needling we got into that um to try to really get that quad to fire and we also use that um to kind of work on your incision because you're having some incision pain um for a while um can you kind of get into um into that as well and kind of like with the dry needling i don't uh if you guys don't know about dry needling much we use the same needles as acupuncturists but we don't um we don't work on meridians and energy flows like they do so we do completely different things so um you wouldn't want to come see me for acupuncture um but we can use it to kind of help restart the muscles, kind of help get the pain down, relieve trigger points. We'll hook electrical stimulation to it to kind of help get those muscles firing um, properly as well. Around, if you want to kind of mention towards that, you know, that more middle of your recovery where you're now starting to get strong, but aren't strong enough yet and kind of, you know, what that process was like. For sure. Um, I had had some previous experience with dry kneeling with, uh, um, hip injury sort of superficial hip injury and it had been pretty beneficial for that um recovery so when josh recommended trying dry needling i definitely jumped on board um we had a couple of we had like three pat kind of go-to patterns depending on where the pain was um and the initial process isn't the most comfortable if you're good at blocking out pain like it's pretty easy to just kind of zone out and forget that there's little electrified needles um, coursing through your muscle. Um, but the part that really, I think, helped to speed up my recovery um, was Josh tried a technique of dry needling uh, with scar tissue. I was having some scar tissue issues with the graft site. Um, so Josh mentioned a scar tissue technique where he would put the needle um, pretty much into, it would be into the scar tissue and then twist it. Um, the process itself is not, again, the most comfortable. It depends on your pain threshold. Sometimes it was fine. Um, I can remember one time I cursed at Josh. Sorry about that, Josh. Um, but it was amazing after the scar tissue sort of twisting dry needling technique, as soon as that needle came out, I felt like I had the range of motion that was sort of being prohibited by that scar tissue. So the immediate result that I felt from um, the dry needling really helped that scar tissue and then helping to kind of again refire those um smaller little muscle fibers in the in my quad that were having a hard time sort of re-engaging um dry needling was a huge help in, in bringing that back and being able to work through some of those pieces that i just didn't feel like i was getting success with thanks robin so, so pat when you were kind of in that same process that we're talking about with robin now um were you going to the rec center as well and then also doing crossfit like how did you supplement your care because you know you can get better by just doing pt but you know you gotta do a lot of homework as well to kind of get back in elite status yeah definitely i uh i started to slightly wean off of the rec center just due to uh the time um i'm the type of person that need someone kind of in their face yelling at them being like 
you know, the workouts on the board, you know, I want to watch your forum and this and that. So I started to kind of wean off of the rec center just to get that early morning workout so that it was boom. All right. I'm eating my breakfast on the mountain or in the back country. And, um, yeah, in bed by seven o'clock most nights, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was a blessing in disguise for me, for sure. I know it sounds gnarly with two, two surgeries and one, one spring there, but it changed my life. And Pat, so when, when you got back to sports, like Robin just got discharged a little bit later and, you know, she hadn't been really able to snowboard unless she had been the last talk to uh, Oregon or anything. But when, when you were getting back into sport and um, skiing and all, were you pretty hesitant? Were you like, oh, I don't know if I want to hit these jumps. I don't know. Um, you know, typically for us, we'll tell you to go back and start with, like, greens and blues, get a feel for it, then go to easy little bumps. And like, yeah, yeah. Um, is that kind of what you did, or did you just go into it? How did it work? And then tell us a little bit about how the rest of your winter went, went with you. And, like, uh, I know you and Tanner Hall were working a lot together on shooting videos and all that stuff. Like, how did you go from that all to going to the status? So basically, this is where the age comes into play to help me because I've definitely had a surgery and then went straight to the streets to try and film an urban handrail or something and instantly got hurt. So basically, it was slow down. Don't even think about going to like A-Basin or Keystone or any of that. Don't even pay attention. Worked straight up until uh, January and then once... Once January started to hit, it started to get pretty cold. It was all right. Let's let's go get turns in at Copper Mountain. Let's uh, let's do a lot of skinning. Um, I'd never done as much skinning as I'd done this year, and and that was a huge help for me. And just basically living off of uh, living off of how tired my legs were. It was like my goal every day was to just get my legs as tired as I could get them and and um and get ready for the winter um I would say about February mid-February I felt to I felt about a hundred percent um there was still like a small uh, a few maybe two or three little special ways my leg would kind of like tweak or if I hit a uh little patch of snow it would kind of flex a little bit but yeah, it's all about just setting up a game plan and and just initiating on it and uh, just really going for it and knowing what you're getting into and, and knowing what the consequences are is a big thing where I, lot, I think a lot of young kids just are like, oh, my, my leg's back, my, my, my cast is off. Like, let's just go out there and chuck ourselves again when – you get old and, and when you get old, it's, it's tough. <laughs> so Amy sent in a question and she was asking, and I'll look at both of you, but Pat, you're on mute right now. So let's ask you first, what was the hardest exercise you had in PT uh, for your recovery? Did you have something that, I don't know, when we made you do something, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Or maybe it took you a long time to actually be able to master that or anything like that. So, sorry, you're still muted, Pat. So the dry needling definitely hurt. I'm super scared of needles. I have been for like mad years. And uh, that hurt really bad. And it helped so much at the same time. So I kind of like got over my own little uh, barrier there with kind of using needles more and, and doing that. Um, I feel like that helped me a lot with getting my quad back to being able to, um, to kind of go for it. Um, I feel like I slightly could have went a little bit harder on the physical therapy in New York, which I felt like it kind of set me back for when I came out here. Um, but once I got out here, I can't think of anything exactly of a, of an exercise, the exact exercise that was tough for me. Um, but 
definitely the dry needling and then the good old ACL to the butt. That one is definitely the rough one for, was another rough one for me, but those are just kind of stretches, not exercises. You mean when I was stretching, you trying to get your butt to your, or your uh, heel to your butt? Heel to butt. Yep. Yep. Yeah, those good times. Good times. <laughs> Robin, did you have any uh, anything that was that you can remember? Yes. So in the return to sport test, you have to do a series of jumps, and one of those series of jumps is a uh, um, three jumps in a row. So you do it with your unaltered leg, and then you do it with your surgically repaired leg. Um, and it took a lot of practice and a lot of time to learn how to jump on one leg three times in a row. Um, I failed my first return to sport test. Actually, I passed that triple jump, um, but I did fail my first return, return to sport test and I had to go back and take a piece of it. But that triple jump is, I actually questioned Josh if this was really a motion that I needed or if he was just making me do dumb monkey tricks because it got a little frustrating. Um, but I got it in the end with some practice and some more strength training. There is research to show that that is a, a useful testing, um, but that is a tough thing because we make you jump on one leg and you know you can kind of get used to jumping up and landing and that's it, we're done. But now you got to jump, 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 land, explode, land, explode, and that can be hard to test but or hard to trust your leg, but it's nice when you can start trusting it in somewhere here where we're controlled and then take that out in the snow and have more confidence that you can kind of get back to, to what you're doing. Um, and Josh, just so you know, I have used that in my returning back to trail running. I've definitely appreciated having that. So thank you for making good. me do it. Has trail running been good coming back? Are you getting the mileage? Yeah, definitely. Some days are better than other days. Um, the knee almost always feels great. I had some meniscus um, work done, but that doesn't really bother with trail running. Um, the quad still gets pretty sore if there is a lot of downhill in the running, but it's coming back. I would have been ready for the trail race this year if they didn't cancel it. So would both of you say, you know, you're both discharged from therapy. I haven't seen either of you in over a month, um, Patty, even longer. You know, are you guys just hanging out now or you're just like, okay, my knee's better, I'm back? Or do you still do like PT type stuff to make sure your leg's strong um, and ready for all the sports you want to do? I definitely am still doing a ton of the strength training and PT exercises. Um, on a daily basis, I still do one-legged squats just to kind of help continue to, um, build my quad and, and my hips lost a lot of their strength as well. Um, but every day there is some piece of focused PT like exercise, um, because I know I'll be back on snow and I don't want to have to go through an injury again. Pat, are you so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt there, but uh, yeah, I definitely, uh, I ride my road bike in the last couple of weeks, not as much as I'd like, but I definitely uh, am still fully focused on on my legs and my quads and just kind of seeing those muscles from where they were before my surgery and then where they were during my surgery and then where they are now is I definitely want to keep them where they are now and uh whatever I gotta do to to do that I'm gonna do so it's definitely it's a it's the way she goes you gotta pay to play you know that's definitely fair and um it's nice to hear from you guys you know just doing all your hard work and it's, it's nice to see it pay off you know and it is a lot of hard work um on your recovery and um if you do put in the work in though, you'll get back to it. And there is research out there that shows that, you know, not everyone gets back to sport. And is that more of a mental, is it a physical? It's, you know, it's hard to say. You see um, some people in the pros like Adrian Peterson who got back in like seven months and never missed a beat. And then another guy like RG3, he still, he didn't come back for a few years and now he's a backup quarterback when he won the rookie of the year. And so it's always hard to tell there's so many different components um, with it. So I really appreciate you guys coming in and kind of, you know, maybe it's people that might get an ACL uh, surgery down the road. Maybe it's someone that's doing it right now or has had it in the past. And it's kind of nice to kind of see what what you guys went through and how you dealt with it. And one, to kind of feel like, you know, you're not alone um, in this recovery. And 
sadly in Summit County especially, there is probably more people than not that have had ACL surgery. Dr. Cunningham is probably the most popular person in Summit and Edwards County. They, everyone knows him. Um, but yeah, did you guys have anything else that you wanted? Any lasting thoughts from uh, Robin Pat or Dr. Cunningham of, of what you guys wanted to share? I figure we'll kind of wrap this up in the next few minutes. Josh, I was going to ask you one thing. Um, is there, you know, I the one thing I see quite frequently, and I don't know if Robin and Pat, if you guys experience this, but right around month three to four is kind of a tough time because patients come in and they oftentimes have a lot of patellofemoral pain, kneecap pain, and you know, pain with squatting or, or loading the knee like stairs or um, things like that. And, and you know, it always seems to be at, at that, that point that the muscle imbalances are causing maltracking of the kneecap, but that seems like a tough, you know, transition point. Just, um, you know, you're, I think, coaching patients and more of an emotional um, support system than me because my visits are pretty brief, unfortunately. But, uh, but I don't know, that's, that seems like a tough time because people have been like, oh man, I've been through this three or four months and, and now I'm having this pain on my kneecap, what's going on? I, that's something I, I find, and I don't know how, how common you see it, but I, that, that we have to talk people through. That's a difficult time, it seems. Yeah, I mean, that, that definitely can be because what typically tends to happen around, depends on what you've had done, but maybe two to three months, you start feeling really good. Um, you're not there yet, um, but you start feeling good. And so, you know, around here, when we start feeling good, we just go do stuff and we start doing more and more and more. And I think it, it just gets overworked and, and people don't necessarily think they're overworking. It's like, oh, you know, all I did was um, I stood on my leg eight hours at work and I hadn't been to work in, in two months. Um, and that's a lot for that leg. So that leg um, is obviously a lot weaker. It's been through a lot. And so I think kind of in that, that zone that you're talking about, Dr. Henningham, people are, are finding out their limits. And I tell a lot of people to kind of listen to their body. There's good pain, there's bad pain. Bad pain, I would say, is sharp pinching pain. Um, you know, a dull pain when you're going through it, that can kind of, you know, like at a two or three out of 10, that can be an okay thing. You know, you're working that leg, but if that dull pain escalates to like a five or six, you need to back off. And, you know, during that time, I feel like people are feeling better overall and maybe don't have a, a full understanding of what their leg is telling them or they don't want to listen to it. Um, and they'll kind of push. And it is kind of that, that kind of roller coaster where feeling good, feeling good, doing a whole lot of stuff, did too much, I went back down. And then you kind of rest a little bit, change things up a little bit in PT, and we go back up. And it's kind of that, but hopefully you're, you know, you're still going, going up the whole way. Um, but definitely try to have a lot of conversation, like listen to what your body's telling you, realize that you know, things that you're going back to that are normal for you isn't normal for this leg right now. It will be eventually, but you, know, you did have major surgery a few months ago. Um, and you know, we're impatient, we wanna, we wanna get back to everything. So I think that's one of the bigger things. And then once that happens, we can do a few things. So sometimes we'll tape to kind of unload um, some of that pressure or help with the tracking. Um, sometimes we'll do the dry needling if the quad's not firing or it's firing for a certain amount of time and then it gets fatigued so it stops firing. So we try to help build that endurance. Um, and then a lot of just patient um, and PT communication. Let me know what's going on because we don't do the same thing every time. If you're hurting this day, maybe we're just kind of helping relieve that pain. Now you're not hurting, let's kind of push you a little more. And so it kind of, uh, we all have to kind of listen to each other and uh, have a lot of good communication. To hope, hopefully those, those pains will probably come, but hopefully they don't cause a real setback. I think what's hard during that time as well, like Josh was talking about the different types of pain is there were pains that I hadn't felt before. So trying to describe that pain or knowing if it was an okay pain or a not okay pain was really challenging. So just keeping that line of communication with the professionals, I think is so incredibly important in continuing the healing and not roadblocking at that four month sort of time frame. Yeah. And then I, uh, I definitely was looking forward to that time because I had a, a decent amount or not a decent amount, a lot of pain. I uh, planned that move home and was like, Oh yeah, I'll be able to get back there in seven days. And, and then a few days later than that, I was like, oh, man, I'm still out here in, in Colorado. Like, this pain's it's pretty uh, pretty painful. But uh, you kind of hear the whispers, oh, you know, it'll go away around this time or that time or this time. And, uh, yeah, it was just kind of a built-up time that I was like, oh, sweet. Well, this is going to go away at this time, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to get better, and I'm going to be back way sooner than they think. and 
that was completely the wrong mindset. It was just more of the long, the lines of, well, day I got into CrossFit, I was like, look, I had both my knees done. Dave helped me out here. And he was like, all right, I got you. We're going to set you up on this mellow little program going on over here. When they're doing this, you're going to do air squats. And then if you're feeling like anything's hurting in your knees, stop doing what you're doing and just come over here and row or do this or do that. And the communication was key for that. And I've, I thank all you guys so much for what you do and, and uh, the passion that you bring along with it. And yeah, super thankful. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah. Anybody else have anything else they, they kind of want to talk about? It was kind of nice to go through, you know, the very beginning of recovery and see where you guys are at now. Um, but any other lasting tidbits or anything like that? You know, I, I think, again, I, I feel so fortunate because, you know, patients like Robin and Pat are, you know, so fun to work with because they're just so motivated, like you said. And I, I go to conferences, national conferences and and other, you know, talk to orthopedists that do what I do from other parts of the U.S. or even other countries. And uh, and certainly it's a whole different ball game in terms of having people that are just so motivated to get back to things versus someone who really doesn't have that motivation and uh and drive and you know those docs are really trying to you know the therapist for that matter trying to you know instill that in people for for a better outcome and uh so it's just great you know i feel so fortunate to have um patients like you guys and and uh that's what makes my job so fun and uh so thanks for putting this together josh yeah thanks for joining in everybody i really appreciate it um, hopefully it was useful for some of the people, um, you know, watching now. Um, it's been great. It's been great working as a team and, you know, from working all over the country, Dr. Cummins, exactly right. Just having patients that want to get better just makes our job so much easier and, and it helps motivate us too. Um, because we see how motivated you guys are. I was like, well, we don't want to let you down. We got to, we got to keep working with you and keep, keep getting you back to what you need to get to. Um, so yeah, so excited for you guys. Thanks everyone for joining um really appreciate it and hopefully we'll do something more like this in the future